Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We've gathered today to acknowledge our common grief, to remember a life well lived among us, but to point our hearts toward a resurrection that is sure and certain in Jesus Christ. I would ask that you take one moment and make sure that all of your cell phones are silenced, either by turning them off or turning the volume off, because we would not want this occasion to be interrupted today. And then let's just bow our heads for prayer. Father, it is truth that we need you every day. But then there are those days that we need you more than we ever have. And so have we arrived today. And yet against the backdrop of the greatness of our need, we find a God whose love cannot be comprehended and whose mercy cannot be measured and whose grace is beyond understanding. May you be present today and may your work be done in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, as we celebrate your servant, in Christ's name, amen. It's been a hard year, so many nights in tears, all of the darkness, trying to fight my fears. Alone, so long, alone. I don't know who I'd be.
proud of you, girl. She's one of mine. I'm honored today to stand here on behalf of my precious friend, Amy, and read to you the beautiful words that she wrote about her precious mother. I love this family with my whole heart. First, let me say on behalf of our entire family, thank you for allowing us to experience the goodness of God through your love and prayers during this tragic time. We are still reeling from this unexpected loss. Please continue to pray for our family, especially our Nancy, whose life we are so thankful God spared that horrible night. Because our Joni was not into having parties or being the center of attention, I never had the privilege of publicly lavishing accolades onto her. So I hope you will bear with me while I try to do her memory justice. And forgive me if I ramble because my thoughts have been a jumbled mess. It is hard to put in just a few pages what mother meant to all of us. We would need a book to hold the laughs she provided, the love she gave, the miracles we've witnessed in and through her life. My mother was a rare gem, and I was blessed beyond measure to be her daughter for almost 52 years. There are so many things I could tell you about our Joni. She was funny. She had an infectious laugh that all of us would love to hear right now. She was super smart. She even skipped the 10th grade, and I called her my nerd mother. Her work ethic was off the chart. And anyone who ever worked with Joan Floyd will testify to that fact. She was also brutally honest. You had better not ask her opinion unless you really wanted it. And sometimes she would give it to you anyway. And the annoying part was that she was usually right. Her famous saying when I was young was, when I'm right, I'm right. And when I'm wrong, well, I'm never really wrong. So, oh, how I miss her. We would be here all day if I tried to tell you all the wonderful things about Mother, so I will center my focus on the top three. First, she was a giver and never a taker. My granny told me when Mother was a little girl, she went without lunch at school for weeks to save money to buy Granny a heating pad because they were too poor to afford one. That love for helping others led her to become a nurse. She should have gone on to medical school because she diagnosed and treated my grandparents and enough people in this room to put me through college had she been paid a physician's fee. The phrase, what do you think, Joan, has been repeated countless times in our family. And I can't really think of a single time she was wrong. And as a child, I spent a lot of time at both hospitals where she was nursing supervisor and later had the privilege of working for a short time under my mother at lung and chest medical as an x-ray tech. This gave me the front row seat to see her nursing skills in action. I was so proud of her. And I've always been amazed at her tender touch and calm demeanor when she was working with patients, be it in a medical setting or in one of our homes. I did not inherit that tender gene, and my children will testify <laughs> that they always preferred Mimi when they were sick or having surgery. Hunter asked with every surgery he had, is Mimi coming? And the answer was always yes. If one of us went to the ER, Joan went to the ER. It's just who she was, a selfless servant. She never spent much time worrying about herself. She just pushed her needs aside to care for the ones she loved, and she loved us all fiercely. Second, she was a prayer warrior. The older mother got, the more she prayed, and she prayed for so many people. Marvin said that at every meal, mother blessed the food, and then he would proceed to pray for every member of the family and the Praise Village neighbors that needed healing. And I tend to think the spirit of her mother, Alice Moore, had fell upon my mother and her sisters because that trio prays for everybody they know that has a need. 
I was in one of their group texts, and you've never seen so many prayer requests, and I couldn't even tell you half of who they were praying for. And I could park right here all day and tell you about the countless prayers she prayed for me and my family. Even Tuesday night when she was in excruciating pain, Sharon told me she was praying. I love knowing that my precious mother left this world speaking to her Savior, and I can promise you that whether the words were spoken or simply said in her head, she was praying for her people because that is what she did. Next, she was a singer. My mother loved music. She wasn't as much a fan of today's new music, but loved the old hymns and the songs she grew up singing with one of the Moore sisters. She shared her beautiful voice in nursing homes and with sick friends, with patients, and at Christmas, or any family get-together for that matter, she would always break out in song and give you the stink eye or walk up and pinch you if you didn't sing along. <laughs> I didn't know until this week how much she enjoyed sharing songs with her Praise Village neighbors. Trust me, she did not do it because she thought she had a beautiful voice, though she did. And she did not sing for compliments because she never believed she deserved them. She sang because it was how she shared Jesus. Songs just bubbled up in her spirit and they had to come out. If it had blessed her, she believed it would bless others, and she couldn't help but share. I love to hear her sing. I love to hear the famous Moore sisters. They used to sing in revivals when my granny preached and at camp meeting. Even here today, in a few minutes, we will hear a recording of them singing a cappella at a friend's service several years ago. Their beautiful family harmony always makes my heart happy. When mother had her first aneurysm on January the 15th, 1998, I can tell you where I was and what I was doing and the many details of the months that followed. I have shared her testimony countless times and if you know me at all, you've heard me say, my mother is our miracle. We are so thankful for all 9,436 days gifted to us by the God of the universe. In that 25 years and 10 months and one day span, Mother got to see her prayers answered when I fell in love and married John. She was present and assisted with the birth of both of my babies. She was there for school plays and sports and concerts and many family vacations to the mountains and the beach. Mimi was there to watch Hunter and Claire graduate kindergarten, high school, and enter college, and just recently watched Hunter receive his Clemson ring. It allowed the Moore sisters to sing many more songs, take a few sister trips, care for their aging parents together, watch their families grow, and send enough group text to fill the Webster's Dictionary. And it gave Mother and her beloved Marvin 25 more anniversaries, vacations, and a move to the Praise Village to enjoy retirement among their special friends. It gave me everything. I do not have words to say how thankful I am to have had been blessed with 25 extra Christmases birthdays, thousands of hugs and conversations, and pep talks that I will cherish for the rest of my life. And it gave all of her family and friends nearly 26 more years of prayers and tender loving care from our own private nurse. I'm so thankful for God's mercy to this single only child all those years ago. But I am honest enough to admit I wasn't finished needing her Tuesday. None of us were. However, I wouldn't bring her back to this world in all its trouble because she is where her heart always longed to be. She had given her heart to Jesus long ago, and if you knew my mom and you're here today, chances are she prayed for you and that you would join her in heaven one day too. So if you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let today be your day. My mother was big into altar calls, and nothing would make her happier than to know that our tragedy brought eternal victory. These altars are open today, no matter what, and you can even make an altar at your seat. 
but do not leave here without accepting Jesus as your Savior. Our family proved this week and 26 years ago that you won't always have the opportunity to make things right. Mother went into that ER for her sister Nancy, but she never came out. Friends, do not wait until it's too late. Before I end my little epistle about our journey, I do want to give a shout out to our Marvin, Papa. You brought so much joy to my mother. And we are all so very glad that God brought you into our family 33 years ago. It wouldn't be the same without you. I am blessed beyond measure to be a part of this family who loves so deeply. Deep, fierce love like ours comes at a great price. And our hearts are paying for it today. As we try to navigate life without our Joni, Mimi, mother, she loves songs about heaven. And I found myself singing them more in the last few days. And in my mind, I can still see her eyes squeezed tight and hands lifted in high, earnest fellowship of her Savior. She was singing. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Amen. Please give your attention to the South Carolina Nursing Honor Guard who are here with us today and have a presentation to make. Nursing is a calling, a lifestyle, a way of living. Nurses here today pay tribute to our colleague, Joan Floyd, and we honor her life as a nurse. We want to formally acknowledge Joan for her many years of service as a nurse and to note that her accomplishments are measured not by those years, but by the lives that she touched through her dedication her compassion, and her servant's heart. Thank you, Joan, for your legacy of caring and for all that you gave to the nursing profession. This lamp is a symbol of all Florence Nightingale stood for, comfort and kindness, gentleness and courage, and an unwavering devotion to duty. Perhaps deep down, Nurse Nightingale knew even then that this light from this lamp would go on shining into the future. On behalf of the South Carolina Nurses Honor Guard, we would like to present this lamp in honor of Joan.
deployed. This white rose symbolizes devotion to Joan's nursing profession. Nurse Joan, we honor you this day and give you this white rose to symbolize our respect and appreciation for being our nursing colleague. Would all nurses present please rise as we present a final tribute to Nurse Joan Floyd. Nurse Joan Floyd, please report for duty. Nurse Joan Floyd, please report for duty. Nurse Joan Floyd, please report for duty. Nurse Joan Floyd, thank you for your service. You have now been relieved of your nursing duties. We are very much going to miss Joan in our choir. She loved being a part of it. And whether you knew it or not, today when you came into this place, you joined to the choir. Because we're going to sing, we want to sing this together. So if you know this, please sing it with us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. I trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand, when darkness sees to hide his face I rest on his unchanging race in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand.
the Lord's people said amen. I stood with John and Amy Wednesday evening. It had been a long 24 hours. And Amy posed this question. I wonder which is easier to be cast into this depth of grief suddenly, without warning, without any time to prepare, just all of us, one moment everything is great and the next moment your life is whirling off course, or to go through the progression of seeing a loved one lose their health day after day after day. And to some degree, you've experienced it both ways. Your mother, Tuesday night, John's father over a period of about three years. And I pondered that question most of the week. Which, which is better? And the answer is neither one. They both stink. Let's be real Christians today. And I suppose it depends on where you are. It's relative to where you are. If you are in the category of you are suddenly cast into dealing with grief, you think surely it would be better if I had had time and could have spent time even watching them progress over time into deterioration. But I would also say, but if you're with someone who's dying every day and you grieve every day, neither one. Death stinks. It led me to another conversation with the Lord because I've always pondered this verse. If you're a child, it's the greatest verse in the Bible. Because someone will say, do you know any of the Bible? And you can look at him and say, yes, Jesus wept. It's a wonderful verse. But there's a great question there. Jesus, why did you weep? At the tomb of Lazarus. Why did you cry? Because you knew what you were about to do. You knew you were going to raise him from the dead. Why are you crying at the tomb? And I think he cries there because we cry there. I think he weeps because we weep. And I think his opinion of death is about like ours. It really stinks. In the Disney version of today, I'd written this and then I scratched it out, but I, let's, let's go Disney. In the Disney version of today, I'll be able to give you words that will instantly answer all of your questions. I'll be able to say something that will illuminate your heart. Something will transpire in these next few moments. And all of a sudden you will start feeling great again. But we don't live in the Disney realm. We live in the real world. And you know the reality of this. The reality is this pain is not going to go away. The reality is... It, it, it's, it's, it's like the tide, and there are going to be seasons where you feel like it is sweeping you away. There are going to be mornings that you wake up, and it's, you're just going to feel overwhelmed by the current of it. And then there'll be days that you wake up, and you'll think, okay, today's a little better day. Only to find out tomorrow, the tide will come again. I want to tell you that grieving is necessary and is actually a means by which God brings healing to our hearts. I'd never really considered this until about a year ago, maybe two years ago now as COVID was raging. And I began to look at all the people grieving around me and asking the Lord, how do I help them? And he carried me to a, pax, to a passage in, in the Exodus. It's actually end of Exodus, first of Joshua. 
Here are the children of Israel on this unbelievable pilgrimage. It's one of the greatest events in all of human history, the Exodus. And for 40 plus years, there's one man who is leading them. It's Moses. He is revered by them. He is adored by them. And Moses dies. And amazing things happen. God stops the exodus when Moses died. He brought everything to a grinding halt and says, you stay right here for 30 days and you grieve because you need to grieve the loss of the person that you love so much. It is in grieving that we find healing. It is in grieving many times that we find God nearer and dearer to us than he has ever been and nearer and dearer to us than he could be in any other way. Realizing these next few weeks and months and years are going to be difficult for you, I wanted to share something personal with you today. There's a lot of things that starts tomorrow, Marvin. You know this. There's another side to, to all of this. The business will start, and there will be accounts to get in the right names, and there will be probate, and there will be judges and lawyers, and, and all of that starts. And all of that is going to tell you what Joan may have left to you. I want to take a minute and make sure you know what Joan has left in you. Because what Joan has left in you is far more valuable than anything she could ever leave to you. First of all, she has left in you strength. Strength. Joan Moore Floyd was perhaps one of the strongest women I have ever known. She was unbelievable. I never saw the woman shook up. She has a brain aneurysm 25 years ago. And she's calling EMS telling them what to do. She's telling Marvin which physicians to call and have them at the hospital waiting on her. And the paramedics, God bless their hearts. They arrive to do what they normally do. And she said, uh-uh, this is what, don't you lay me down. You sit me up, she's got her hand where she's feeling it, she's pushing, she's telling them what to administer and how. Who keeps their wits about them? <laughs> their brain is bleeding uncontrollably. Joan did. She was in charge. She was in charge. What an unbelievable strength. And that's just representative of who she was. I have seen her go through difficult seasons of life, but I've never seen those seasons shake her. She always held her faith. She was solid. She was just rock solid. And I would suggest that perhaps it was the dark season she went through that made her the woman that she was. And while we see this as a dark season, this will make you stronger than you've ever been before. She deposited courage in you. How many times in Joan's life could she have just quit? How many times could she have said, that's enough, I'm done? I'm checking that. I don't need any of this. How many times could she have walked away, given up, been like Elijah the prophet, just went and sat down and said, God, kill me now. I'm done. But in every season she went through, Joan had the courage to persevere. She had the courage 
to persevere, to keep going, and not just keep going, to keep serving and to keep being Joan. She didn't let life change who she was. She faced life as it came, and she walked through it with her head held high. Always willing to step into any situation to offer care, as the nurses have mentioned. She moved into the village, and she became the village nurse. We didn't even have one before. I was with my father and mom at the hospital, and they were sending dad home with hospice care. And so, you know, we can send the nurse out. And mom said, it's all right. We got Joan. We don't need y'all to send everybody every day. We got Joan. And Joan would come over every day, help mom do what needed to be done to care for dad. It wasn't just my mom and dad. She would walk through the village offering encouragement, offering company. Her and Marvin would get the golf cart out in nice weather. You know you could have made some money, don't you? Because they would ride through the village saying, who wants to go for a ride? And you'd be around here and, you know, here they'd be on the little caravan, the Marvin Mobile, just laughing with people, having a good time. And give her half a chance, and she would sing you a song. If you think today that your courage is lacking, take hers. Because she's put it in every one of you. She's given you strength. She's given you courage. And she's given you joy. She has put her joy in your heart. Through all of the adversity, through the past 25 years, I never saw Joan when there wasn't a smile somewhere on her face. She learned to take joy in the simple things. The sunset, the sunrise, the clouds, her and my mother, forgive me, send pictures to each other of the clouds above their house. I'm like, you know you can walk out there and look at them, right? I mean, you live across the street from each other. And then they post them on social media. Let me tell you what I think. And I think there's something for all of us to learn here. I think Joan saw these past 25 plus years as bonus time. She could have left here 25 years ago. And God was good to her. And this is bonus time. And I'm not going to waste my bonus time being miserable over things that don't matter. Look at that cloud. Isn't it beautiful? We would do well to learn that. I don't know what she's left to you, but I know what she's left in you. And here's the amazing thing. It wasn't Joan. There's been a lot of people who grew up in Packlet who grew up in churches in Packlet, who became professionals, who had families, who lived lives and didn't live them like Joan. What was the difference with Joan? It was Christ. And she would say, it's not me, it is Christ in me, the hope of glory. You're going to be fine. Because the same Christ that dwelt in her dwells in you. And he will be faithful in every season of life. Here's what the Apostle Paul said to us. 
He said, I would not have you be ignorant concerning those which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. And this is the difference today. It's not in sorrow. Because like anyone else who's lost a loved one, we all sorrow in death. But here's our difference today. We sorrow with hope. I don't know what you do if you don't have the hope of the resurrection. You may have a great life. But if in this life only, if this is all you got, Paul says you're of all all men most pitiful. We sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. For we believe Jesus died and he rose again. And even so, God will bring with them those who sleep in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those which are asleep. Because the Lord himself will descend from heaven. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And Joan will say, I beat you. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And then we shall always be with the Lord. What's the difference between us? We have hope. And I want to ask you a question today. Friends, do you have that hope? There is a certainty. It's appointed to every one of us that this moment will come. I can't promise you that you will have weeks or months or years to prepare yourself. Had Joan not had her heart prepared years ago, Tuesday night would have been that much more horrible. But because we know where she is, Tuesday night did not hurt her. It broke our hearts. But it carried her to what she has lived for all of her life. What is your hope today? I hope you'll give consideration to put in your hope in Jesus Christ who will never leave you and never forsake you and who is able to give you victory both in life and in death. He is the one who can sustain you through it all. I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation God gave blessed consolation that my trials only come to keep me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. Well, I've been to a lot of places, and I've seen so many faces, but there were times when I felt so alone. But it was in those lonely hours, yes, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know that I was his own. I thank God for the mountains, and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. For if I never
prayer. Father, we give you thanks <laughs> that Joan is through with it all. And you have brought her through victorious through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I believe she has spoken to death and said, where is your sting? And I believe she said to the grave, where is your victory? I believe she answered, thanks be unto God who hath given me the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But Lord, I pray for this family who will still be going through it. Remind them of the strength and the courage and joy that has been lived out before them, among them, and placed within them. And that the source of those things are only found in Jesus Christ. And I pray that if there's one here today that doesn't know you, that this would be the day that somewhere they would steal their heart and make their calling and their peace with you. May your joy continue to strengthen this family is our prayer in Christ's name. We're going to lead the family out into the foyer. I know that many of you did not get to speak with them before the service, and they will be out there so you can briefly greet them on your way out. And we're going to leave here being serenaded by Miss Joan herself. If everyone except for the family would stand at this time, please. Oh. 